Okay, I want to welcome you to the first of the FTC British Columbia webinars for this season. Our topic tonight is all about robot hang time. And I would just like to introduce Brandon Baker. He is one of the, ro are you guys robo runners or Raybots this year? Raybots? Uh, yeah, sure, let's go with that. Okay, <laughs> um, he's one of the mentors with the Reynolds Raybots team. <laughs> so I will turn things over to Brandon. Cool. <clears throat> Glad Nick's, uh, Nick's our team captain. He's not exactly sure either, so I don't feel as bad. <laughs> So I'm just going to be going over this presentation on uh, robot hanging um, with the idea of inspiring ideas, not necessarily presenting finished products, although I do have a, a sample robot uh, made out of Connects that I'll be showing you guys at the end. Um, so throughout this, feel free to ask questions at the end of each of the sections, and I'm going to try to go through relatively quickly to leave lots of time for the, the actual questions. Uh, so here we go. So this is what we're going to be talking about. So I uh, tried to pick things that are the most relevant for high school robotics and I did some of the calculations simply for you guys and I'll also be providing Christine with an Excel spreadsheet later with some of the detailed calculations. Um, so we're going to talk just quickly about design criteria, um, how to use power um, and account for that because that's the one variable you can't really change in the motors. You can change the torque, you can change the speed, but you can't change the power. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on that. And then the other thing you can't really change if you're using a different form of lifting mechanism is energy and how to account for that and make the best use of it for lifting a robot. Um, then I'll talk about some specific wrapping mechanisms, some specific lifting mechanisms, again, with the idea of inspiring ideas. Uh, and then talking a fair bit about stability and how to use that to take advantage of your energy or your uh, power. Uh, and I'll show you some videos with the example connect bot. So design criteria. These are trade-offs. Um, so, you know, a lighter robot is better, but lighter robot means you probably can put less motors on it. So um, up to a point. Um, and this is always the case with like design criteria. So you need to design or you need to decide on your design criteria based on your priorities uh, with your robot and what you've set your goals for for the year. So uh, the lifting mechanisms don't need to take up much space, but they do need some prime real estate, ideally top center of the robot. So you may have other mechanisms in the way. You may need to find a way to route the cables or other lifting mechanisms or you know, you may be able to take and make use of another mechanism that you already have in that area. So uh, speed is another key criteria. So I, I put e includes ease of alignment because even if your lifting mechanism is really fast, if you spend all your time trying to align it, then that doesn't help you in the competition. You really need to be able to come up quickly to the bar, grab it and lift all smoothly and without much of delay. So now with that comes complexity. Uh, more complex things tend to fail in more complex ways and new ways in every competition. So be careful with that. But, you know, complex mechanisms can impress the judges. Right, Christine? <laughs> if they work. <laughs> so... Uh, so what I put here, the last one, buffer for time or height um, for referee decisions. What I mean is you want to not just design it to barely lift off the ground and have that one millimeter of clearance. You want to have a, you know, a bit more clearance than that, even though it's maybe beyond what the rules require, just so that you're certain when those referees look at that robot, they know it's hanging and not touching the ground. So, all right, power. So... Again, this is the one thing that you can't change about the motors. So the, the, the more you gear it down, 
And depending what type of gearing mechanism you use, uh, the less efficient it becomes and the more power you lose. It never helps you by giving you more power. So uh, you must make an effort to reduce the, uh, the either the force that it takes to lift the robot. So by reducing its weight, adding springs, doing something. Um, or reduce the distance that the actual robot needs to move up. Um, so I, I put the little power formula in there. So power equals force times distance over time, uh, which works out to energy over time. So you can lift an infinite weight with almost no power if you don't have to move at any distance or you don't have to, or you can take as long as you want to lift it. Um, so those are, that, that's just a, a simple way to interpret the power formula and to take it into account. So your goal with the robot is either to um, reduce the distance, increase the time, which for the competition, you don't want to do that, or decrease the weight. So really for robots, what your goals are is to um, decrease the weight, decrease the distance you need to move it, and to a point, increase the power available to you. So um, making use of energy and power available in first competition. So these, I won't get into too much detail here. This you can look at later once the PowerPoint's posted on the, uh, the website. But with a 20 amp fuse and a 12 volt battery, the most power you can get is 240 watts. Now that's a lot of power. You're probably never gonna actually get that out of your battery. Um, without browning out your controller, but that's the, it's close to the theoretical maximum. Obviously the uh, nickel metal hydride batteries can go a little over 12 volts when they're fully charged, but you know, they have internal resistance and other losses that reduce that available power. So um, I included the go build the motors. I understand some of you guys use different motors on different teams. So on the next slide, I actually have broken down the other motors for you guys. Um, but the Go Build the Motors can provide about 20 watts output at their max power for about 40 watts input. So just if you've got all eight of your motors running um, at full power, you could very, or even stalled, because at stalled, they, they draw more current than that. Um, you can easily blow the fuse for your motor or for your uh, battery. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to choose how many motors to hook up to your lifting mechanism or your driving and other mechanisms. So um, now I did a really simple calculation here. And for a 10 kilogram robot, 22 pounds, that should be roughly the order of magnitude of most of your robots. Some of them might be double that. Some of them might be half that. Well, probably not half that, it'd be tight, but it should be around the right edge. So for each watt of power, so with a 20 watt motor, you should be able to get about 20 centimeters. So one centimeter per watt uh, vertical lift. Now that's, that's pretty quick. So that would be within one second, you could go from the ground to 20 centimeters up. Now that's not accounting for acceleration. That's a really simple constant rate climb, but with appropriate gearing, you know, one motor should easily be able to lift uh, any of these robots up quite quickly. So um, if you guys want a lesson in gearing later, maybe we can do that, but that's not part of this course. So <laughs> um, now what I did include is just a simple way to analyze gears. And you want to, if you want max power in your motor, out of your motor, you need to design the gearing for approximately half the stated torque of the motor, which also works out to half the max speed of the motor. So if you look at that graph down on the right, it's where those two lines cross and you end up with that max power on the green, uh, the green parabola there. So, um, so when you're designing and doing the math for your gears, make sure you're using half the max stated torque of the, uh, of the motors because that will give you closest to max power without doing too much experimenting. So again, account for some losses in whatever gear train you use. So these are the 
motor power calculations that I did. Um, I didn't, I can't see my notes right now because of this presentation view uh, on this computer. But um, once I post the PowerPoint online, you'll be able to go to this. But uh, game manual zero, are you guys, anybody familiar with that? Nod your heads if you guys have, yeah, you guys are one, some are familiar with game manual zero. Game Manual Zero seems to have done this, and it, it seems that whoever's in charge of Game Manual Zero, um, that they apparently developed a test rig and tested these motors and come up with substantially different numbers than I did, but they also came up with numbers that are very different than the published data. So um, my number is just using the, the published data from uh, Rev or the other groups. If you see the Rev motor there, uh, 6,000 RPM, the Rev HD Hex, uh, 6,000 RPM, 1.1 kilogram centimeters of torque works out to 16 watts approximately of, of power um, at max torque. And now I put the formula that I used up there. It's a very, it's a rough approximation formula, but the published power, oops, oh. <laughs> the published power um, right from rev is 15 watts. So, you know, I came out with 16, they telling, they're telling us that it's 15, that seems reasonable. The Neverest series motors, I calculate 11 watts, they published the max power at 14. I feel like that might be the max power in and they're not accounting for losses or I'm not quite sure. But, you know, without, without actually sitting and putting all these motors on a dyno and running them through my tests myself, I can't verify these numbers, but. You know, somewhere between 10 and 20 watts per motor is pretty standard for all the FDC motors. Um, okay, does anybody have any questions on this part? I'm just gonna open it up for questions for a second before we go further. Um, I, I, this is Kevin. Um, I, I, I have been told that the, the, the motors of, uh, for example, Gebuda series of motors, they are actually the same motor with the different re, uh, gearbox, right? So why the, the max power is different uh, if they are same motor? I understand the torque should be different, right? Yes. So the torque is different. The reason why I like, so looking at this, the highest power you get is with no gearbox. So the 6,000 RPM, you get 23 watts output. So my guess is that each of these motors, when they tested them, had a different efficiency, which affected their max torque oh, or okay. their max speed. So I'm guessing that's why everything else is lower than 23. Interestingly enough, the other one, the 15 or the 11, one. 1,150 RPM motor also shows 23 watts max theoretical. Um, I imagine in real life it would be lower than that because it does have a gearbox. Yeah. But that that would be my best explanation for why. Okay. So that generally lower gearing, lower total power output. That makes sense. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? On that note, it does. It is worth paying attention to that the difference between twenty and twenty-three watts, just based on math using the the motor curves, kind of indicates the level of uncertainty with these calculations. So I would not trust these calculations to be like, oh, I'm getting the one hundred and seventeen RPM motor because it's got one more, more than the eighty-four RPM motor. I, I, Either one could produce more power than the other, especially if it's newer or older or how much lubrication's in it. You know, don't don't take these numbers as a uh, gospel. So. All right. Making use of energy and power available. So um, you could use something other than motors or the battery to produce your power. You're allowed to get power in FTC from deformed materials. Um, I will show an example of this uh, later, but this type of action where it's a single motion used once in the competition is a great opportunity to use um, some pre-stored energy. Like if you 
use a mouse trap or, you know, stretch a bungee cord or an elastic or, you know, any other form of energy storing medium except compressed air, <laughs> then you can use that um, to indicate it. So I don't know what Yuvraj is showing me there on the screen, um, but he's probably showing some sort of spring, hopefully. So um, so one of the other advantages to doing that is you free up your motors for your other mechanisms. So you can hold all that energy in the spring with some of the tiniest servos. So. Um, I would recommend if you're trying to figure out mechanisms for this, look into anything that has to do with old snares or traps for hunting. Because old hunters, gatherers, they, they really invented a lot of cool mechanisms that take very little force to release a lot of energy. So if you look at all the different snare releases and catches and trip wires and things like that, that's a great source of inspiration for how to release a spring in the competition using a servo um, without putting much load on the servo. So uh, the major downside to using other sources of energy, especially a spring, is you get one shot. So uh, you don't get to unreel it and try to put it back on the hook if you screwed up. Um, so definitely take that as a, as a factor when you're doing your um, design criteria and constraints. All right. Um, does anybody have any quick questions on that one? I'm not going to go into a lot of details of the different types of mechanisms you can use here. But... Um, and for using a spring, um, because based on the previous page that you show us, uh, we, we at least need to have like a kind of like a 10 watt of the energy stored it over there right is can this spring store that much of uh, energy to okay, give a robot this is a great uh a great thing to mention so springs don't store power they store energy so um, energy being measured in joules the theoretical power output of a spring is infinite um you know if you had an a, a infinitely light spring with no mass it could release all its power as soon as you let it go, or all of its energy as soon as you let it go, which would be infinite power. Um, now, since that doesn't exist in real life, we know we're not uh, <clears throat> we're not in the Marvel universe, so um, you end up with a a slightly limited power output based on how much mass you're pulling. You can do those calculations. Um, so. Uh, the real criteria with springs is to make sure you get a spring that stores enough energy um, to lift the robot to the height that's required. So um, if you remember the basic high school physics formula, mass times the force of gravity times height gives you your energy, your potential energy. You want that same amount of energy to be stored in your spring at whatever height you want to lift the robot to. So, and the spring formula is... Uh, one half k distance it's stretched um, squared, I believe. I'd have to look that up again, but uh, you can look up the spring formula for energy and uh, you know select the spring that's appropriate. Um, it, you'd be surprised how small like a, two or three regular elastics might be enough to lift your robot up because. Um, you know, if we just do the simple math of a of a ten kilogram robot lifted up ten centimeters, so um, ten kilograms times nine point eight times point one uh... yeah that that makes sense um yeah another idea my team of students they are interested in is that um they saw some like a examples that they potentially can use in um, the driving power to, uh, to hand the robots over there. So basically, um, if you design your... Absolutely. Uh, That'll actually come in later slides. 
Okay, then then I I I of course I will not continue. That's great. Thank you. No problem. All right, I'll move on then. If there's no other questions on springs, cool. All right, gravity mechanisms. So, um, can be passive for holding like a hook, and I have a feeling that's going to be the vast majority of what we see in the competition. I don't think there's going to be too many uh, grabbers that are actually closing on the bar and gripping it. Um, you could, but uh, I don't really see the advantage in this competition. So we'll see what we end up with in actual, uh, in actual matches. But um, so there's either a simple hook like the eye hook or the, uh, the clevis hook, which has a, a closing mechanism on it so that once it's on, it doesn't fall off. Uh, there's a Lucas waiting to be admitted. I'll do it. I think I can admit. Um, okay, so uh, Christine, let me know to be careful of the clevis hook. I wouldn't have considered it, but if they pivot in multiple directions, any commercial ones would be considered to have multiple uh, degrees of freedom. So don't use them. <laughs> um, and like I said, you could actively close them like a mechanical claw. I do not see the advantage to that, but that's a uh, you know, there's all kinds of cool grappling hook designs online. If you look those up, you can you can see. Um, you want to design the hook, whatever one you choose, for positive stability once on. So I'm going to get onto that uh, in the next slide. Exactly what I mean. So, um, so length and security are inversely proportional. So if you have a short hook, it's less stable than a long hook. There we go. Okay, so hook design. Now this is where we get into the actual engineering of the hook a little bit. Um, so positive stability for the hooks is gained by taking this uh, dimension A that you see on the right top there. So that's the distance um, between whatever line is perpendicular to that uh, to the, the tip of the hook. Um, I actually don't know how to get my pointer up on this slide. We can see your pointer. We can see oh. your pointer. Oh, you can see my pointer? Oh, yeah. wonderful. Um, so yes, so this distance here, it, it whatever edge is tangent, uh, to this edge of the hook. So if that point's touching the bar, this distance matters with how easy that hook will slip onto the bar. So the bigger that distance is, the more likely that when the hook is sitting there, that the bar will slip all the way into the hook. So you like, I'll, I'll show some examples of this in, in a later slide. Um, once I get to the example robot, uh, I did a bunch of hook designs and I can show you. Um, but basically that dimension needs to be bigger. Now B, the height between the eye and the center of the hook arc, um, that also bigger is better. The downside here is if you make this one too long, then you run out of room for whatever rope or other lifting mechanism you have attached to the hook to actually lift. Um, so that's, that's some of the trade-offs there. Uh, yeah, so a hook seems really simple, but it is actually a little bit of uh, complex engineering that goes into them. Um, I just talked about two of the dimensions. You can see that the hook's thicker here. That's to deal with bending moments. Um, you know, we got two of the two of the guys that are in university now paying attention to this profile, so they should be ready to deal with bending moments as their next classes. So. Um, Anybody have any questions on the hook? No? OK. So uh, lifting mechanisms. So you have the Spanish windlass. Really simple mechanism. I don't think it'll come up in these robots, but it could. It's basically twisting two ropes together until they get tight. 
uh, Chinese winless. So this one's a differential form of winless. It's over here, uh, top right picture. And the rope is unraveled from one drum at the same time as it's raveled up on another. Now, the reason why I included this is that instead of using gearing, you can get a really efficient energy transfer with this type of windlass with a lot of torque. So um, you don't need to gear it down. The problem is, is as these drums get closer together in dimension, you need more and more rope to actually, uh, actually wind. So, but you can completely eliminate the gearbox. Like you could hook up a 6,000 RPM rev motor to this and put some dental floss on it with a little pulley. And it would probably quite easily lift most robots. So I'll be impressed if I see that in competition, but you know, just, just as an idea. Um, this is another cool mechanism called the differential pulley. Again, you know, it, it's a cool mechanism, a little bit difficult to get right and to get lined up in manufacturing. So I don't expect to see this in competition, but who knows? Um, and the last one is the simple winch. I, for some reason, expect to see a lot of those in competition. <laughs> so, but the downside to it is it's, uh, it takes up sometimes more space and can be less efficient if you add a gearbox to it. So uh, that's them. Actuator. Uh, I included a picture of muscle up here just because, you know, I expect to see some robots doing that sort of motion to get up to the bar as well. Um, so you can make an use of an existing arm instead of having to build something specifically for it. Downside is you have to do weird motions like this um, to get up, which means that you need a lot more. There's going to be a lot more force on the joints of your robot than maybe needed to lift the, you know, 60 gram pixel. So, um, so now this one gets into what uh, Kevin was mentioning. So lifting mechanisms that don't actually lift or it's not quite, I, if I stand corrected there, but um, I believe Kevin, you were saying that they so use the drive motor. Very different than, than this one, but uh, it's, it's the concept is very similar. Yes. Okay. So maybe not quite the same as a constant center of gravity, but um, you know, you can you can consider the wheel motors and use them in some way to do this. Now, I included a link to a YouTube video here. Um, feel free to click on that later once the once the PowerPoint is uh, posted, but um, it's just an example of another past team that actually uploaded their mechanism that pretty much does this. Um, now I made this model in SolidWorks before I found that. I just found it hilarious that they were almost identical. Um, so, uh, yeah, the the model that the, we uh, my some of the students from my team is uh, fascinating about that one. It's a, uh, um, it's just a regular robot. Uh, you have a uh, uh, a hook, and uh, you raise your hook to a position at the before the end game, and then you just max speed drive towards to the, um, to the to the read, and. Uh, uh, but the, the 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 hook it's a little bit sh um, shorter than the bar, and because the 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 acceleration actually let it tip it over, tip it a little bit, and uh, using that power to to hook it over there. It's, Interesting. It's a, it's a, just a it's a really cool if you can make it. <laughs> but, so uh, that'll get into center of gravity a lot. So the next couple of slides deal with center of gravity because if you want to mm -hmm. make that type of mechanism work, you really need to be paying attention to the center of gravity so your yes. robot hangs perfectly level. That sounds like something we saw at um, FRC a lot in uh, uh, Rapid React. That was a very common ba like basic thing. Um, like you hit the first bar and like you flip up a mechanism and then the mechanism was basically just a ramp 
that just yeah. ramped your robot onto it and then it hung in a notch. Yeah. Yeah. So that you could even pole vault it. You could just have two little sticks that kind of flip down and you drive over them and pole vault the robot onto it. You know, like I said, you can get real complex. Um, so I'll be interested to see all those mechanisms. Um, just don't stab the mats and destroy the field. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> constant center of gravity is just slightly different than all of those because you're not using the kinetic energy of the robot to lift. You're just balancing the robot in such a way that you know, if one part of the robot moves down, another part of the robot moves up. And the key part of the robot to move up is the wheels. So um, the rest of the robot can stay stationary. Uh, you could even put a pulley on the robot that has a weight attached to it so that, you know, as the weight drops, it lifts the rest of the robot up. Um, as long as that weight doesn't touch the mat, then that still would qualify. So, um, but when you do the center of gravity calculations, you'll realize that when the weight drops, the overall center of gravity of the robot will always go down. So um, the only time you need any energy other than potential energy is when you're raising the overall center of gravity. So if you keep the center of gravity dropping in your lift, then you're not really lifting, um, but the robot will still end up off the ground. So, um, yeah. I'd love to see some of these. Again, may not be a good idea for the competition, but it could be. All right, holding force. So those teams that choose to use a winch or gearing directly to a motor to lift their robots will be more concerned about holding force than maybe the other teams. Christine's shaking her head no. So the rules this year for hanging are the complete oh, opposite yes. of any hanging rules we've ever seen. And yes, it the way it's the worded hold. is that the robot has to be visibly in the air at the end of the buzzer of end game. It can then descend back to the mat. So there's you don't actually have to hold it in the air after the end of the buzzer. Correct. So if you climb, though, and you choose to use the motor as your only holding force, you'd be running current through that motor for the entire duration of that, which depending how you gear your motor, uh, could stall, like would stall it essentially, if you're continuing to drive it, um, you'd be stalling it and drawing a lot of current from the battery. So you could do that. That's one method of holding force. Um, but you do need to make it to that end buzzer. Um, so I, I realized the robot could be on during that. Um, you know, it's it's not the most efficient way to keep your robot in the air. So if you have the opportunity and the time to design something, something as simple as a ratcheting pawl, um, you know, or some cams like this, uh, like this sailing cam for holding a rope, you know, or a one-way clutch, you know, all of these are methods of holding things. Um, again, as Christine says, you don't technically need it for this competition, but it's good engineering to use something like this. So, uh, and it could help you in FRC, especially if they choose to do a climbing thing again this year too. So, in general, that the heavier your robot it is, that you should consider this. That yeah, right. You certainly won't be overheating your motors. Yeah. If if you use something other than the motors to hold it. So um, now I, I put this little graph in here, which is actually from chemistry, but it applies in this case too. Um, so there's points of stability. So wherever the energy is, uh, wherever the change in energy or the derivative of the change in energy with distance is zero. So any of these points. So you have a couple points of stability. Now this is a point of conditional stability where it's high um, because anything, any change in motion will cause the robot to fall. Um, so that'd be essentially balancing. Whereas these points, it takes some energy to overcome it. So, you know, if, if you want to get creative and use fancy cams and off center pulleys that hold your robot. Those are all cool things to include and, you know, 
if I was judging these, I would definitely be interested to see those mechanisms. Um, worm drives, inefficient. But I say may work, they generally work unless you really don't use them right. <laughs> so they only hold loads through friction. Now, a lot of people think you can't back drive a worm drive, but uh, depending on the pitch, so um, I put down here the different types of worm drives. So you can have single start, two starts, three starts, even four starts. And that has to do with how many spirals are actually on the worm gear. Um, and that changes the effective pitch substantially um, for the worm gear. So obviously something steep like this, if it's well lubricated with grease, could easily be back driven. So take that into consideration. You know, this one probably has seven starts up here. It's, you know, see how steep the pitch is on those worm teeth. Um, so if you tried to turn this main gear, it probably would back drive the worm gear. So um, now the, the key takeaway from this slide is that worm drives, if they're able to hold the thing with no power applied to the motor, uh, that means at best your worm drive can be 50% efficient because it's overcoming all that friction the entire way winding your robot up. And if that friction is exactly the right amount to hold your robot, then that gives you the best possible efficiency at 50%. So the chances are that you're going to be well below 50% if you're using a worm drive, which if you're going for speed and lifting with a single motor, that's definitely something to consider. So um, worm drives are very good for a significant gear reduction in a small amount of space. They're absolutely terrible for power. <laughs> so, uh, any questions on worm drives? I expect to see a lot of them in competition anyway. So, stability, lifting straight up. Um, this is probably the most important part of this presentation for um, the upcoming year's competitions. Um, I put some example robots here that I just uh, drew up in Inkscape. And so here's an example where the motor is down to the right of the robot and it's offset from the center of gravity, but there's a stabilizing arm up directly above the center of gravity. So as the robot lifts, it'll stay level. And I'll show an example of this with the example connect spot at the end. Um, whereas here's another robot where the motor's off center, center gravity is in the same place, but once the robot lifts, only the wheels close to the motor end up going up until that cable hits that bar that's on the robot. And then the whole robot starts to come up, but you'd be having friction on there the whole time. So, um, you don't want to have to lift one wheel before the other because when we go back to that power and energy equation where uh, you have force times distance over time, if you in increase that distance substantially, so even though you're only lifting half the robot's weight when you're lifting the one side of it, um, you've increased that distance you have to lift by so much that your, your total energy requirements and then therefore your total power requirements if you're trying to do it quickly will go up. So if you want to learn more about this, most of these pictures in the bottom here uh, are actually from pallet courses. So like people that operate cranes and do lifts for commercial situations, they do all their, um, they do all kinds of courses learning about center of gravity and how to find it um, so they can lift straight without dropping things on people's heads. And there's all kinds of YouTube videos about people not learning that course. So, <laughs> and dropping things off forklifts or whatever. So, you know, uh, the bottom three pictures here to the right, you have stable because um, that triangle goes all the way up to the hook. So the po only point that can actually rotate is at the hook. This one in the middle here is unstable because the triangle is below the center of gravity. So this would actually flip over if you tried to lift this. And the one on the left here again is stable because the only point that can move is way up there, uh, far above the center of gravity. So 
the higher you can have your pivot point above the center of gravity, the more stable your robot will be. Uh, but it will always align. So if you look at this picture here, once you lift, it will always align so that that center of gravity is directly under whatever the pivot point is. So, um, and even if you have a stiff arm and not a cable, like this robot here, uh, you can see how high the wheel is here compared to this one. Now, the reason for that is because the hook itself, hooking onto the bar, is also a pivot point. So, uh, unless you can grab the bar so securely that you can leave her off of it, which might damage the bar or may just spin, um, then you got to still consider the center of gravity with where your hook will be as your robot lifts. So um, I won't ask for questions right now. OK, quick questions here. Anybody got any questions on this? I'll be going over, the, going over this in a lot of detail with the example robot within the next 10 minutes. Uh, finding center of gravity, method one, plumb lines. My favorite method of finding center of gravity, and it's used in all sorts of things. I tried to find a picture of a tank hanging from a ceiling because uh, when I was in university, we went to one of the research facilities in Ontario, and they actually had a full like 30-ton tank hanging from a cable from the ceiling because they were trying to find its center of gravity so they could lift it with a helicopter. So... Center of gravity matters a lot in a helicopter because you end up not flying if you don't center it right. So, um, so yeah, these are these pictures here are actually from model airplane uh, websites. So, you know, uh, model airplanes again, aviation cares a lot about center of gravity. So, you can learn a lot from looking at what model airplane makers use. Um. I didn't clarify the the method this is using is you you hang the object from a point and you use some sort of vertical line as a reference and you draw it through your robot. Um, technically, there's a vertical line hanging di like directly from the point that it's being suspended from, so you only need two points to suspend it from to find the center of gravity. Oftentimes using three or four points makes it a little bit easier to zero in on where the center of gravity is. You may not need that level of accuracy for your robots. Um, another method of finding center of gravity. Now this one is used for model RC cars um, predominantly, but you end up tipping it. And I feel like this one will be a good one for robotics. So if you don't have a way to suspend it from a string, you can just tip your robot over until it balances on one edge and you put a, uh, some sort of right angle there. It can be a square or a box and you make sure it lines up with the point of contact on the ground and your center of gravity will be directly over that point somewhere. Now, obviously that wouldn't tell you where the center of gravity is directly. So you need to do that on two or three sides, depending how many, uh, how many degrees of freedom you care about the center of gravity. Um, but that's another easy way. Uh, you don't need any special tools. You can do it with just a box and or any square object, and that will that will show you where your center of gravity is. So this one's a little bit more complicated. Now this is used for most vehicles, like larger vehicles where they can't easily suspend them or tip them over. Um, and there's a handy dandy calculator that I linked to at the bottom here that lets you use a scale. Uh, now you don't have to use two scales. You can actually use one scale and put it under there with a block as long as it's level and just switch which wheel it's under. So if you measure the force under all the wheels and then you use this calculator, it'll tell you exactly where your center of gravity is in terms of these dimensions. So that's another way to find center of gravity. If you don't care about the height, you don't need to bother with this middle uh, this middle block system. So, all right. So those are the three ways of finding center of gravity. You guys got any questions on those? If anyone is going to suspend their robots to do the plumb line, can we get photos, please? 
and definitely include it in your portfolio because I'm betting the judges would have fun seeing them too. And we need to do that now. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I'll show you some photos. There we go. <laughs> so this uh, robot I made out of Connects uh, one afternoon, um, it doesn't do much, but it shows you that, uh, so I put this little red and yellow ball at its center of gravity so you can visually reference it. Oh, <laughs> these photos all ended up coming together. So um, you can't quite see all of them. Let's see here. Sorry, I'll just fix this. So. there we go all right so um as you can see with these photos no matter where i hang the robot from uh the plumb line always points directly through that red and yellow ball so I hung it from here and I didn't retie it to the robot. I just had this little like hook um, and I'm using this orange line to draw a line through it. So this orange line is just some, uh, you know, just some string that people use for either construction or um, gardening. And it's, it shows up really well on the black background. It is a good idea to take pictures of the robot while you're doing this because it's a lot easier to um, draw that straight line through your robot when it's in a picture form. You can even just crop the edge of the photo over until that line lines up. And you do that a couple places and find some sort of reference on your robot and that'll give you the exact location of your center of gravity. Um, so it's a highly accurate method the one downside is that if you have moving parts on your robot that tend to swing around all over the place, you're not going to get one center of gravity. Every time a piece moves, it's going to change the center of gravity, and then all the lines aren't going to line up in one spot. So that also could be useful if your center of gravity is expected to move uh, when you're hanging. So um, hooks. So uh, I made a couple sample hooks out of Connects. So explaining how this dimension here being longer makes this hook that otherwise looks like it shouldn't hang on. The robot is hanging from this in this picture. So um, there's the robot. You can see that its shadow is not touching. It's, it's hard to see from this picture, but its shadow is not actually touching the, uh, the wheels there because it's hanging. Um, you'll see it's perfectly level because this orange piece here is stabilizing the robot directly over the center of gravity. Um, and the hook is stable because it's long. The point of attachment is directly under the point of contact. And this yellow bar here isn't even touching the wood in this case. Now, this would be a bad design for a hook in competition because if you don't get it right dead on, it will fall off but it's just showing how unstable you can make a hook and make it still work uh, if it's designed well. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum here, this distance is really short. Um, and I'm holding this one because it actually will not stay on the bar at all. Um, you know. The, uh, the next level of that, the one that's kind of in between is using this blue one, which is shorter than the yellow, but longer than the, uh, the black one here. Um, where'd my mouse go? There it is. Um, it's stable, but barely. So the downside is, is the longer you make this, um, the less room you have here to lift your robot. So 
that's kind of the limiting factor with why you don't want an infinitely long hook <laughs> or a full 18 long, inch long hook because you wouldn't be able to lift the robot. So um, here's some examples where I've shifted the guide. So I push the guide far left here. The robot is balanced with these wheels. Um, but as you can see from the right picture, the center of gravity uh, still lines up with the point of rotation up here. So um, it's slightly off here because the wheels are actually touching the ground still. So this is an example of why you don't want it to be off because this mechanism is using the same spring um, for all these pictures. So this one doesn't lift off the ground, whereas uh, in this situation it did. So again, we have the opposite situation. So now there's no guide up high, which means the lifting point is closer to the center of gravity. Um, the center of gravity is here in this case because I put all the weights on one side of the robot um, and then measured where the center of gravity was and positioned it. So again, the center of gravity ends up directly behind. This one's actually barely hanging, um, but not enough that a ref would call it, I don't think. <laughs> so I would stay away from that. Um, here's the same situation again. So no, no guide at the top. So I broke the, uh, the little plastic piece out there, but because the center of gravity is directly under the, the winch, it still went straight up and there's a clear margin here. So, uh, another situation where the guides, the center of gravity is off center, but because the guide is directly over the center of gravity, the robot still hangs level. So the winch isn't lined up, but this part of the line is. So you, know, you can use this type of correction after you've built your robot. So just, you know, it can be as simple as a, a, a metal bar pushing the line out of the way, and that can straighten up your robot. So um, yeah, I'll, uh, I've got a little video here um, that I will show. Can you guys see this uh, robot now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to hit play here. So what I've got here is a just a quick release mechanism that I'm going to hit with this stick. Um, and I, as I said, it kind of takes from trapping if. Uh, if you look into traps and mechanisms, it's got this ball here that's holding the gear in place, and you'll see what happens. So, oh, no. so that's uh. That's just an elastic band on the opposite side. I'm, I got another video that I can show you that um, that better describes it. Um, while I'm pulling up that video, do you guys have any other questions? It's really cool. <laughs> hmm. There we go. Uh, which video can you see right now? The close-up mechanism. Okay, you can see that one? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so I'll just hit play again. So this is it in real speed. So you can kind of see the background wiggling around as the robot free hangs in the air. Um, I put the wheels further back in this one to balance the phone that is attached to the robot. <laughs> so... Uh, so I'll pause it here. So as soon as that Paul comes out of that gear, there's a there's a spring wound motor here uh, from Connex. So that just adds a little bit of extra spring force. That's enough to balance it. It's uh, what's inside of there is actually one of those constant force springs. So if you're familiar with the FT, FRC kits, you end up getting those constant force springs all the time. So you can use one of those um to lift your robot but that wasn't quite enough to lift this robot so i just added one elastic 
And that elastic is just wound the opposite way. Can you guys see the top of this or is the... We can just see up to the gray, settings. looks like a pulley shape. Yeah, that was just a guide to keep the rope from wrapping up into the, uh, the teeth of this gear. Um, so uh, I didn't design this for Zoom. <laughs> so um, I don't know if I can zoom out. Nope. All right. Well, it's essentially two winches. So there's one winch wound this way with the string that's behind this gear. I'll just move this so you can see the string. There. So there's a string here, and that one is wound um, counterclockwise on this shaft. And the other one is wound clockwise on the same shaft so that the elastic is effectively directly lifting the motor, but it goes through this shaft in the main, in the middle so that you can use this, this gear to hold the force. So that is a very simple, easy way to use no motors and lift a robot. So that is the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have one slightly um, like ludicrous question. Um, do you think that um, the jump hang is feasible? Like feasible, yes. <laughs> Smart. Like, like it goes into you that do complexity it? thing. Like, could you? Do you think it's possible to like just build a robot that just jumps up? but still can also participate in normal gameplay? Like its sole purpose isn't just to have a giant spring that launches it? Absolutely. Like I said, this is, the, the method I showed here is one way of using a spring that's quite efficient and very reliable because you wait till it's already hooked on the bar before you engage the spring. So, you know, Jumping robots, yeah, it's a thing. Um, it's actually a form of competition. There's a world record for the highest vertical jump of a robot, and it's in the like tens of meters. Yeah, it might even be even uh, over a hundred meters. It's it's high. Um, so you know, but yeah, you can design a robot that'll jump, <clears throat> but. The downside is, is how do you ensure that it jumps accurately enough to land on the bar? Yeah, I saw, um, like, um, have you, did we show you that video of that FRC robot that um, had like a, basically a vacuum tube? And at the uh, as soon as Endgame started, it started pressurizing the vacuum tube. And then it like, in the last like two seconds, it drove under the bar and just popped up to the traversal run, like all the way to the very top. So the vacuum tube and pressurizing it is not allowed in FTC. Yeah, that, I know that, that's a problem. Like, but there are other spring, ways though. of doing it. I mean, yeah. but that yeah. particular approach can't work. So, yeah. um, course, sorry, yeah. what did the vacuum tube push on? Like the vacuum tube ended up with a piston that yeah, and, like the, the robot kind of like extended. It it was it was a funky thing. Yeah, it kind of extended, and there was okay. I can try to send you the video later if you want. So it was a pneumatic actuator that pushed the robot up like a like a spring. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if you were there last year when I was using the pneumatic actuators to show you guys why they're dangerous and to be careful with them. <laughs> when you when you were like launching the bins, yeah. Bins? Like like the, there was, you had like the one of like those cones. Bins. You were launching cones. Oh too? yeah, the bins on the ground. Yes. Yeah. You launched cones too. Yeah, launch cones. Um, so anyway um, yeah you gotta uh, pneumatic actuators can store and release a lot of power like I said with springs they, they're a gas spring so springs have theoretically infinite power um, depending you know how fast they can release the energy so um, now I'm going to grab something quickly
Kevin, you had your hand up a moment ago? No. Oh, okay. No. So. No, it's a it's an extent. I I try okay. to learn learn Zoom. <laughs> I'm just going to stop sharing here for a second so I can see what I'm doing because I can't see my own video. I still can't see my own video. <laughs> you guys can see me though? Yes, yes. you can. All right. I'm not the most familiar with Zoom. Um, well, I'm going to trust that you can see this. Can you guys see this weird connects thing? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, it, these things only go one way. So if you wanted to have these all spring loaded and then shoot up into the bar with a, a jumping mechanism, they'd all go one way and then the bar would get stuck wherever it passed. So if you design something like that, that'd be the best way to ensure that your jump was successful. So, because I'm going to put it in reverse so gravity acts like a spring. Grab a wooden dowel that everybody should have an arm's reach. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, this is opposite to the way you would use it in the competition. So if this robot was up here or down here, it would jump and then get stuck. So if you put two, yeah. like, two sets of those teeth facing opposite directions, um, it'd be great. So. Um, actually, I've got a better way to oops, attach. So if this yellow ball, can you see the yellow ball in there? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't work. It was designed to go this way. So as the ball goes through, those things all close, but you can't push it back the other way. So yeah. Anyway, I built this probably when I was Oh, I don't know, 13 or 14. So still hasn't been disassembled. And I just like told you can't disassemble it. Oh, no, it's fine. That's what I, I, I built the robot that I showed you in the examples. Sure, out of this sure, you, you aren't sentimental, so. No, I am not. Uh, that's the magic. I designed it to uh, to the eighteen inch specifications to make it you know reasonable sized. It's actually quite stiff. There's no reason you couldn't use this in competition. I'd love it if I saw somebody making a robot out of connects. <laughs> I love connects. Yeah, years ago we saw a robot made out of Lego. It didn't survive contact with other robots. That's not surprising. Yeah. Lego doesn't <laughs> Lego doesn't have the it's brittle. It's very stiff, but it's brittle. Mm -hmm. Connects. Okay, do we it. have any final questions for Brandon? Thank you for doing that presentation. Um, I know yeah. we don't have a ton of people here right now, but once the recording's up on YouTube, we do find that many teams come and watch them. And the discussions on center of gravity is something that a lot of the team should be paying attention to this year. And you've given a lot of interesting ideas for that. So thank yeah. you for taking the time and making the presentation. Um, if anybody has suggestions for other topics they'd like to see covered in webinars, just let me know. Our next scheduled one is actually about getting your robot ready for competition. 
and that's on Monday at four o'clock. And the link is on the firstroboticsbc.org website. Um, so hopefully we won't run into passcode yeah. issues and you will find it easier to get into that uh, meeting. Okay, and I think I will stop the recording.